So um, Bruno is the new curator of pollinators at the Field Museum. Um, he works on some of the oldest pollinators, the beetles. Um, and he did his PhD at uh, Harvard University in 2018 um, and his master's and his bachelor's um, at University of Sao Paulo. Um, currently, he's the assistant curator of insects at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, and today um, he'll be talking to us about palm weevils. So thank you, Bruno, for being here. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it over to you. You can't hear me either. Bruno, we can't hear you. Okay, I was looking for my Zoom window. <laughs> uh, cool, we can hear you now, you're good. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, very much, uh, Crystal, for the introduction and for the invitation uh, to speak here today. Um, it's a, I'm really happy to be here. So um, last year I couldn't attend. I was uh, being poured over by rainfall in Panama, doing some of the work I'll be talking about here, and um, and uh, and so it's really nice to be participating this year when. It's actually also raining in Chicago now, but near freezing. Uh, and I can say for a fact that uh, rainfall in the tropics is much more pleasant. Um, so I'd like to start um, by, so you might have noticed the good and evil weevils in my title. And um, the reason why, uh, I'm going to talk about them is uh, because uh, I think a lot of people maybe don't even think weevils can be good um, and that's definitely true if we try to google information about them so did this um, last week and that's where we find something about contamination even with their feces which I don't think are that harmful anyway um, but uh, in general, people are asking, what's the purpose of weevils? How can it kill weevils? Uh, and so on. If we do the same thing for uh, insects, we find uh, that uh, insects are better. They do pollination. But then if you look here in the bottom, you see that uh, the, the other questions about them being dangerous or how to kill them, that kind of thing. Um, so according to our Google search and most information av available on the internet, uh, weevils are just annoying pests. And uh, insects, at least in general, do pollination, but they're also hateful and dangerous. So um, is this how we humans, uh, what, what we see about insects? Is this a result of our biases and what we can observe in the natural world? Um, there are some ways to go about that. Um, one of them is to see what humans are looking at when they look at uh, insects. So one good way to do this is this amazing online platform, uh, basically uh, almost our social network for people who love nature, iNaturalist. This is my page on iNaturalist. I like to see what people have been finding about weevils and palms. And uh, let's say we could go through all of our naturalists. So look at all photos and then look at them and score each one for a behavior of interest. Since we're talking about good and evil, let's see, let's, um, let's uh, look for photos in which insects are visiting flowers, so potentially pollinators. And, and then we could see with those millions of records how it varies in space, time, taxonomy, and so on. And uh, luckily today, we don't need thousands of interns to do this. Uh, uh, computers have advanced enough that we can have a computer look at millions of photos. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. I designed a artificial intelligence model to recognize two things on iNaturalist photos, whether or not there are flowers in the photo. And here are some examples of photos of insects that show them on flowers and whether or not the photo has any 
natural history information at all. A lot of the photos are pin specimens or specimens being, or insects being handled or labels, that kind of thing. So we, we don't want to include that in the data set and we can have the computer uh, do that for us as well. Um, and what I should say that's important for this community is that the technology to do this nowadays uh, has been pretty much solved by computer scientists. You don't need to know much about computing to do this. The hard part is what we can contribute, which is to teach the machines what is relevant. So in this case, the hard part was to assemble a training data set with images that were relevant so the computer could achieve a high accuracy. So in this case, it was telling me whether or not there was a flower in the image with about, uh, with 99.2% accuracy, which is pretty good, probably as good as interns could get. And what do we see if we apply this to all of financials? Um, I downloaded this data in January. Uh, so there were almost 20 million, uh, million observations and some observations have multiple images, uh, but about 14% of those observations of insects showed them on a flower. And about a third of the observations were insects at lights or in, in a jar or being handled. So uh, not, uh, or not really considered them. So that, that's about two thirds of the observation were useful for those purposes. And uh, from those, uh, a, a good size were insects on flowers. But there is a large variation um, among, uh, uh, across taxonomy. Uh, it seems, for example, people really like to photograph butterflies and moths. They are the most popular insect order on a naturalist. And uh, on the other hand, flies and mosquitoes are definitely not as popular as their true abundance in nature, probably because it's hard to take a photo with a cell phone from uh, those from those organisms. And if we look across those major insect orders, there's a variation in uh, also their flower visiting patterns. And if we look within uh, those groups, of course, we're all interested specifically in beetles. Here, you can take a moment to look at your favorite beetle family and see how many of the photos of those beetles uh, or how many of the observations on a naturalist have been made on flowers, uh, at least for the 20 most common families on iNaturalist. And of course, there is not, uh, not only an even uh, taxonomic focus, but also an even geographical distribution. Uh, this platform started in the United States, so it's, uh, it is uh, reasonable to assume that's the most well-sampled place, and that's true, uh, especially we only find really high number of observations in a small space really um, mostly near large cities in the US and uh, Europe is more or less well covered, not as much uh, in terms of uh, a large number of observations locally, but uh, otherwise uh, across the world, uh, it's very spotty. There are also lots of errors in the data set. So if we look, for example, here in Africa, we see a line on longitude zero, which is most likely an error. So this has to be cleaned it up a little bit. I'm still working. But uh, in any case, there are some important biases, but uh, I mean, we those biases exist in anything, right? So our natural history collections have biases. So uh, we just need to account for them. We could, for example, if I'm interested in the information of a flower uh, visitation, I could divide in each geographical area the number of photos or observations showing insect, uh, an insect on a flower by the total number of observations in that place. So this would uh, at least um, control for the total number of observations in a given place, right? And uh, so that's what I did. And, um, but we still see some weird patterns. Um, in every single insect order, the proportion of uh, images or proportion of observations on flowers decreases and decreases sharply in the tropics. And that's uh, expected for some groups. Maybe we know, for example, that bees are much more diverse and uh, um, probably even abundant um, in 
in, in mid latitude. So this would make sense for bees. We know that lots of fly pollinated plants are found in high latitude, so that makes sense. But for beetles, that's weird um, because uh, that contradicts what we know from literature. So in a recent revision, for example, on um, uh, in, in general of uh, arthropod flower visitors, uh, the summary is that it, especially in, the, in tropical environments such as lowland forests or upland dry, and dry forests, uh, beetles are the second most common flower visitors. Um, and uh, there, there's a bunch of uh, recent papers showing their importance as well. Uh, including from some people who are, I, I saw are watching this uh, talk now, and also a recent revision that I wrote uh, with uh, Juliana Hahn and uh, Gael Kergoat, uh, in which we uh, were uh, talking about the, how, uh, you know, calling attention for weevils as pollinators. This is currently a preprint, it's already available, but it's in review. But anyway, from literature, we would expect to see maybe uh, an even geographical distribution, even an increase in number uh, of um, beetle flower visitors in the tropics, but we, instead we see a decrease. Um, I think there are some things going on here, and one of them might be just that with cell phones and the goodwill, we're not reaching those beetles. Um, another thing that varies between tropics and temperate zones is um, the height of the canopy, for example. And so if all of the of that floor visiting action is taking place in big trees high up in the canopy, it's not gonna show up in a naturalist. And um, so, and, and that begs the question, is this only a naturalist? Um, or are we as a community in general missing some important facts about nature because of our human biases? And how could this kind of information inform our knowledge on the generation and maintenance of beetle diversity? And that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, today. In two main topics, how it can use uh, collections and field work to discover new diversity, not only of species, but also of natural history, what those species are doing in nature. And I'll use one example uh, to show how uh, this information on natural history, and especially a detailed information, is important for me to understand uh, the process of diversification uh, of uh, beetles and in general and weevils in particular. So collections provide a lot of useful data. Um, I found my uh, almost all of the field work that I did was based mostly on herbarium collections and information that I could find about the plants and that, uh, that I knew the, the, uh, the weevils occurred on. And then we know where uh, uh, weevils, which plants weevil interact in part because of the labels, uh, particularly in more recent specimens when people started paying attention to this. And, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the collections themselves are a product of what we know. So uh, Aline Lira mentioned that earlier today, and I'll, uh, I'll show again. So th these are all specimens, for example, for the genus Udius that uh, um, she presented on earlier today that uh, were ever collected and deposited at the MCZ at Harvard. And I got a loan from them earlier this year. And that's what Aline has uh, uh, amassed in the past three years. And what changed between them is that now we know something uh, about the natural history of those weevils so we can target them and we can find them when it wasn't uh, of a, of possible before. It's not because the information didn't exist. So she showed this. Uh, we didn't actually combine this. I, I took a print of exactly the same page. Um, so 60 years ago, Gregorio Bondar published two new species that he mentioned that were described over hundreds of specimens collected from flowers of Cecropia. 
but until recently, uh, this didn't make it into the general literature. So as recent as 2014, the Handbook of Zoology, it was mentioned that wood uh, use may occur on palms. We don't really know. Um, but, uh, and, and I wish I could say that we knew this because uh, we read uh, Bounder's work in Portuguese, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't like this. We basically rediscovered the natural history of Udios by chance. Alini's main supervisor, Pasquale Grossi, started noticing uh, that uh, you can breed those weevils from old Cecropia flowers in a leaf litter, and, and that's how this, um, project started later on we found that it was known for 60 years but uh, in any case so there is these two-way information after we know this information we can grow collections and the collections can inform uh, more work and udios doesn't occur on palms but a lot of things do occur and that's what I'm mostly talking about today you might think of palms as a uh, rainforest trees and a lot of them are, um, but they're actually much more diverse than this in, uh, in habitat and form. So they, they, it's much easier to collect in one of those uh, little grassland, uh, grassland palms, for example, than the super tall forest ones. And they are really important in tropical environments. So for example, out of the 20 most abundant trees in the Amazon, uh, seven are palms. And they're also super important for us humans. They are staple food. So whoever here attending this is from South or Central America might know Pupunya, uh, Chontaduro, or Pejiba, or Pijba, which are uh, the peach palm um, in English. And, or you might know the African oil palm. And by the way, both of those species are both pollinated by weevils and have weevil pests. Um, not the same weevils though. And uh, you might know the products made of the made from them, uh, the um, industrialized and more broadly sold around the world. So they're, they're really big deal. And how do you study um, the weevils visiting flowers of those palms? Well, it, it needs um, some work. So uh, one way is climbing. Um, of course, easier for the shorter palms. So we can uh, observe them up close. And it's a lot of work, you have to learn some things. It's a, it's a bit dangerous, but it's rewarding. Because when you climb uh, a palm and then you, you get a, you, know, you bag its inflorescence, you shake it, you find something like this. Now for other crowds, when I showed this, they mostly see the bigger black bees, but I, I hope that for us coleopterists, you saw all the many different beetle species that uh, we, we had there. I think uh, as I was counting now, there were at least three or four families, but most of them were weevils. And uh, when you do this, this enables discovery of new species. For example, all those uh, weevil pollinators that are of palms and the cyclopaceae, another um, tropical family that uh, I did together with collaborators in Brazil and Colombia. Um, but also, I don't forget about the bad or the uh, bad weevils. Uh, they are the ones that also damage plants. So. Uh, Jennifer mentioned her role in fostering research uh, in Latin America, and when I was in Panama, I actually um, got involved in one of those during pandemic. People found the this weevil feeding on um, potatoes, um, and I was the only nearby expert uh, who could look at them uh, uh, at that point, and we described it together. One of the 
not so um, one of the evil weevils. But we, in addition to species, we find uh, morphology and behavior. So by looking closely, we found this larva. So this is the first instar of a Cricullionae in the genus Ankylorhynchus. They later instars look like the th this thing here on the right. Oops. Oh, shit. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> Do you need help? Yeah, I did a click here on where I shouldn't have clicked, and uh, but I'm back. Okay. okay, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, just lost track of time now. Okay, but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> here <laughs> on the right, uh, there is a. Uh, uh, that's what they look like in later instars, but when they just, when the eggs just hatch, they're flat and have falcate mandibles, and they focus on killing uh, all of their brothers and sisters so they can be the only ones remaining in a seed and consume it. And also, that gives material for taxonomic revisions. Uh, in this case, genus and Kilorinco is the same as that larva. Uh, each box here is a different species after revised. And then um, we could find this amazing morphological diversity, at least in color. Um, and the things that kind of look all the same, uh, yellow and uh, small, turn it out to be different species. So it's actually harder to identify on the kilorinkos now than before. But uh, to summarize, field work enables discovery of new species, new interactions, uh, new information about larvae, and systematics, and all of these are key to understand the ecology and evolution of pollinators and of beetle pollinators in particular. And, uh, and now let's go to one example of how we can use all of that information to study uh, evolution. Um, one of the big observations in our field is that there are lots of species of insects, right? So in this um, word cloud, the font size is more or less proportional to the number of described species. And of course, there are lots and lots of insects, but also there are lots and lots of plants. And uh, it has been for a long time, a, uh, one of the explanations for all this amazing diversity has been the interactions between insects and plants. So the, the, the thought goes more or less like um, uh, the insects that feed on plants damage them, and so plants defend themselves with very specialized chemicals. And uh, by circumventing those defenses, and, uh, and uh, 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 it, that's the main process that leads to uh, insect specialization and uh, speciation. So that, that's uh, one of the major ideas for, um, for especially for phytophagous beetles. Uh, but uh, what I would like to highlight is that herbivory does not entail a single kind of interaction. Um, it's true, some herbivores damage plants, they may, may suck plant sap, they may destroy seeds, they may, they may destroy leaves, but some of them are really they, not that bad. They, uh, they may be commensals feeding on that tissue, not really causing any damage, or they may even become mutualists, such as uh, ants that are fed by their uh, plants and defend them, or by uh, pollinators, uh, particularly beetle pollinators, tend to uh, feed on the plants that they pollinate to. And uh, I, I focus on flowers in part because we can find all of those interactions on flowers. And they're these amazing resource where we can find a lot of things going on together at the same time and easily trackable. And uh, the, the, because we have all this variation, in natural history, we can study the role of herbivory and diversification by comparing flower visitors that differ in their impact on host plants. And that's what I did um, for, the, uh, for some um, palm flower associated weevils, particularly those associated with this one species of palm found in dry forests, and mostly because there was already a lot of background information from which it could build on. And the, the, this palm is visited by a lot of insects and all of the most abundant and 
species are, are shown here, and uh, they are found throughout the range, the geographical range um, of this plant. And uh, there are two questions that I wanted to know about natural history. Um, whether or not the adults are pollinators and whether, whether or not larvae cause a damage, say what, whether or not they, they, they fed on live tissue. Um, and uh, let's start with the second question first. There are, in any plant, and uh, palm flowers are not different, there are many possible breeding sites. And um, it's important to know what the, uh, the different um, weevils are, 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 are feeding on and how they are doing it. So for example, these are two species of uh, weevils, uh, a beridine and theromine, and they both lay their eggs in male flowers, but uh, they do it a little differently. What you're looking at here is a female of Andronthobius uh, boundary, a theromine weevil that has laid an egg on a node male flower that has already released its pollen and uh, the female is now pushing the flower a little bit to um, speed up abortion that would happen anyway. So the flower would shed this flower um, or the plant would shed this flower anyway. And its larva will develop in the leaf litter in the decaying uh, flower tissue. Whereas for Microstratus ypsilon, this other species, they are able to drill into male flowers, lay eggs there, and, uh, and the larva will consume entirely a perfectly healthy and live flower. So it, it will sterilize a male flower that will ha never have a chance to, to uh, release its pollen. So they're consuming the same tissue, but it makes a whole lot, a lot of a difference how they are doing this. Um, so we, I did a, a lot of uh, observations of, uh, of a position and opening of different uh, plant tissues to find the larvae inside and then uh, using DNA barcoding to correlate larvae in adults. And with that, we got a pretty good understanding of uh, which beetles were breeding on live plant tissue like, uh, or and which ones were um, on dead plant tissue. So that's uh, uh, one question uh, done, another one remaining. We want to know whether or not they're pollinators and the biology of this plant helps in answering that question. So flowering lasts about a month for each inflorescence. And uh, what happens is that male flowers open first, release pollen, and then there's a period of like a week to 10 days when nothing is happening and insects leave and they will go to other flowers. And a subset of them is also attracted to female flowers and those are the pollinators. And uh, the, this is more or less what's shown in this time lapse with one photo taken per day throughout three weeks. Um, one of the ways in which we can assess which ones are the pollinators is by bagging co-inflorescences. And that's what we get when you do this. I'm not sure you can hear the noise, I hope you can, of all the little weevils crawling in this bag. And we can get all of them with an aspirator and then count for several bags, how many um, of each species. And uh, I am showing this information here as a network because we want to see which species of uh, insects connect male and female flowers. So those four nodes here are the flowers. And on top, uh, we have the female flowers. In the bottom, male flowers. And on the right, samples that were done during the night. On the left, samples that were done during the day. Each one of those dots is a different insect species. And, uh, and uh, the color and the thickness of the dots represent uh, how frequent and how abundant they were. So what we're looking at here are those species, the ones that are connecting both male and female flowers. And particularly, there, there is one species that was found at median abundance, but really high frequency was always there, especially at night, which is a weevil 
that is always found in female flowers and male flowers. So those are possible pollinators. And then we complement this with direct observ observation of behavior. Some of the weevils, they are always there, but they're lazy. They don't touch um, the receptive stigma. So they're not really uh, pollinators while others actually touch stigma. So they, they are definitely transferring pollen and uh, some of the bees, or actually one of the bees did that too. The, um, and by doing those direct observations, we can also count uh, how many times we saw a particular species at uh, one female flower, not only in the whole inflorescence, and by collecting them individually, we can count pollen, and most of them carried some pollen, even when it was not super visible at the scope. Um, the, and then with this, we can sort all of those beetles and bees into those, or mostly the beetles, in those two axes, right? So are they good? Are they pollinators? Uh, are they evil? Do they uh, breed on live tissue? And then the answer is that some are good, some are evil, some are both. Um, and uh, so we have the situation in which we have many species that all made and breed on their host plants. They are distributed through the same space, interacting with the same plants, but they differ in the kind of interaction. And that's really important because that enables us to do comparative work. And the main question that I wanted to ask here is whether antagonistic interactions lead to higher host associated population divergence. So um, again, going back to our theories of how new species of plant feeding beetles arise, uh, is it true that we need antagonisms to explain this? Or maybe uh, the populations of beetles are just diverging equally uh, uh, independently of the kind of interaction that they have with their host plants. For this, I focused on weevils. I had nine species of weevils that were abundant and frequent enough throughout the range of their uh, host plants and I included two palm species. That one that I talked to you about in dry forests, but also a relative in the same genus, they differ so they diverged over 25 million years ago. Uh, they have a very different habitats. One is a rainforest species, the other one is dry forest. They have a parapatric distribution, and yet a lot of the species of weevil flower visitors seem it to be the same. And the first question is, are they really the same? Um, and I did a kind of whole genome sequencing called uh, Red Seek for both the beetles and the plants. Um, and this is the setup as I started, right? So nine species of weevils, five of which were shared between both plants. And uh, I'll spare you of the details, um, but basically there was a really, really strong signal that uh, those are not in general the same species. In most cases, the weevils that were in, different, uh, in the different palms were definitely different species by any measure of uh, uh, genetic divergence. Um, and uh, there was one very special case which fooled me for a while. So those were, those three uh, I'm calling cryptic species. So I, I first identified them using genetics. They were firmly considered one single species with rather variable, uh, at least color uh, morphology. And uh, it turns out that they, one of them is more widespread, the green one, and more variable in morphology. And the other two are, um, are, are specialized, each one on a different uh, uh, host plant. But those species, they are sympatric in many places. So you find them side by side in the same plant at the same uh, time. Um, one curious thing about them is that currently, I don't know which one should get the name Ankylorhynchus trapezicolis because uh, what some of the few reliable characters that I found to separate them morphologically are, uh, can only be seen in males. And uh, it turns out that's the one of the two species of Ankylorhynchus for which the, uh, the holotype is a female. So I'm still searching the rest of the type series to, to see if it can give us a clue 
of which one of them should bear the name and which one are new. But uh, in addition to male genitalia and other uh, male secondary sexual characters, they differ uh, somewhat in the patterns of, uh, in, in the morphology of the scales and their, uh, especially the ventral scales. So one of the species, it's variable, but uh, it varies uh, between very elongated and branched scales, which look kind of like um, bee, uh, the, the kinds of hairs that bees have to carry pollen. Um, and they can be more stout too, but it's still uh, quite evenly branched. While in the other species, they are more stubby and more scale-like than really uh, branched um, hairs. So uh, maybe they are not even uh, equally good pollinators. That remains to be shown if there is any functional difference. But now that I know that those species are different, uh, my initial setup actually consists of 13 different species, not nine, um, encompassing the three kinds of interactions. So pollinators that also breed on live plant tissue, um, species that don't, uh, uh, that, that don't pollinate but uh, breed on live plant tissue, and species that don't pollinate but uh, lay, uh, breed on, on dead plant tissue. And what I was looking at specifically is the relative importance of geography and host plant as barriers generating uh, differences in, uh, uh, between those populations and so uh, new species. And particularly we want to know if those antagonistic beetles, the ones that damage plants, show a more important role for uh, host plant as a barrier. So to show you visually what I mean, Let's say those weevil species are distributed in space. We might expect that the populations that are closer to each other are more similar. Or since they interact closely with a host plant that has their own genetic divergence, it could be that their genetic divergence is more well explained by the plant rather than space or by space regardless of the plant. Right, so that's what I'm looking at with this genomic data set. And here I'm showing what the results look like. On the y-axis, we have pairwise comparison. So a comparison between two weevil samples and uh, how different they are genetically. On the x-axis, uh, we have two panels on the left, uh, how distantly they were collected. So the geographical distance and on the right, the genetic distance between their host plants. And this is one example of a weevil species in which host plant genetic distance explains a lot more about their population divergence than geography. Um, but in other species in the same genus shows the opposite pattern. Uh, geography explains a lot more about their, uh, their uh, genetic divergence than host plant. And then I did that for the 13 species of uh, weevils and comparing the three kinds of interactions. And I will summarize now all of this data as a number that compares how strong is plant against space in determining the divergence between those populations. And that's this. I'm omitting the names of the species because they don't matter as much. Uh, what matters are the colors which show which ones are pollinators, the green ones that also breed on live plant tissue, which ones breed on live plant tissue, but they're not pollinators, and the commensals, the orange ones that are, they breed on dead plant tissue, um, but are, uh, and are not pollinators. And what I want to show here is that this scoring of what's more important, plant or geography, does not show any pattern regard, uh, regarding the kind of interaction that they had with their host plants. So to, to summarize, um, those, those careful natural history observations enable comparison between types of interaction. Instead of talking about herbivores, just generally, oh, those things feed on plants. We're taking into account how they feed on plants and what are, what's the impact that they have. Um, the, but it doesn't look like that the host, the role of host plant on population divergence depends on type of interaction. So we don't really need antagonisms. We see host plants derived divergence, even in the species 
that were feeding on that plant tissue. So they, they, they definitely are, do not have to deal with plant defenses. So, so then, uh, at least for flower visitors, it seems that host plant qualities that are related to, so th those species, they use the, those flowers to find their mates, right? So they use their uh, phenology, they use their volatiles um, as cues to find mates. So it might be that, you know, sensory divergence. So this is what really driving divergence in those, uh, in those beetles, not really um, uh, adaptation to plant defenses. Uh, that remains to be shown uh, in the next few years, we'll be working on this using whole genomes. And, uh, and I forgot to say at the beginning, um, I have a postdoc position available. So if any of you there is looking for a postdoc position to work on this kind of problem, uh, come talk to me. Uh, but, but to finalize, what I, I like to say is that uh, the, so this is a comparison at population level, but we can also look at longer time scales. So last year, together with Lourdes Chamorro, um, we published the first more comprehensive phylogeny of drive um, We want to expand on that now. And it's a group that's really cool because it includes things that are feeding on live tissue, such as seeds or stems, and also dead wood feeders, uh, things that are feeding on monocots, dicots, and ferns. So there's a lot of variation throughout deep time scales that we can tap into to understand uh, how those uh, differences in, 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 in what herbivores are doing impact the diversification at longer time, time scales too. And sometimes there's room for surprises at, really sh at, at much shorter time scales. So I told you about uh, Ankylorhynchus weevils that are both pollinators and breed on live seeds. And that's what I knew until last year when I went to Panama to do some experiments on the role of beetles and bees as pollinators. And to my surprise, the species of Ankylorhynchus that's found in Panama actually cannot damage plants. So their larvae are unable to drill and to dig into plant tissue. Um, so here in the bottom, uh, there is a graph showing on the left is 10 days after flowering, if we go count eggs and larvae in, in those flowers, um, we barely find any larvae. So almost everything is eggs in the flowers that remained on branches. For the flowers that were naturally aborted by the plant, we find a lot of larvae. What this means is that even the developmental rate, so something is preventing development of those larvae, the eggs don't even hatch if the flowers are alive. So there is a lot more involved interaction there that I, um, I also plan to understand better in the future. And finally, climbing is cool, but it's time consuming, it's hard to do. And when it doesn't scale, when, when we, if you want to understand the, the beetle or weevil diversity in natural history at a large scale, what can sources of information we can use? So I started this talk with an example of how citizen science data sets can be useful. Um, but also uh, one thing that I'm just saying now and I'm really curious about is uh, to use the pollen that's in specimens in collection and use uh, both morphology assisted by artificial intelligence and DNA barcoding to understand the origins of that pollen. Had we done that with Udius decades ago, we would know it's associated with Cecropia and not palms. So expect to find a lot of new things there. Uh, so to summarize the, the message that I wanted to take from this talk today is that we don't know enough about natural history. There's a lot to be discovered and we need uh, this if we want to understand uh, evolution. And there are many ways uh, to obtain uh, this information, both from collections and directly from nature. Um, weevil plant interactions, you might have thought of weevils as just evil, as just damaging plants, but they actually uh, evolve across the mutualism antagonism spectrum. So that gives us a lot of opportunity to understand the role of those interactions in generating our diversity. And the details are, are really important to understand evolution. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the organization, especially Crystal Meyer for the invitation. These are all the institutions in which the work that I mentioned here has been done. 
or that, uh, uh, that has funded this work. And I would like to thank my many, many collaborators throughout the years that uh, helped me to do this work as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Bruno. Um, so as a reminder to everyone, um, go ahead. Yeah, thunderous applause. <laughs> Um, so as a reminder, go ahead and post questions for Bruno in the chat, or sorry, in the question and answer. Um, so we do have one question so far. Um, this is from Ainsley Siego. Um, I'd like to know how many times those feathered scales have evolved in weevils. Um, do they show up in other pollinating species? Um, so that's one thing I'm curious too. We can uh <laughs> work on this together maybe uh because it so they showed up uh definitely for example berry dines uh there are lots of them that have somewhat feathered uh scales and others not um so i i don't have a good sense like quantitatively but qualitatively there are lots of lineages in which i see them coming and going uh whether or not they have any function as in, in pollination that's something that remains to be shown. In our review uh, on the weevils as pollinators, we mentioned these kinds of hairs and uh, their potential role, but it, it's not clear to me how all uh, pollen, weevil pollinators would benefit from carrying pollen. Uh, th those that I showed definitely do because they need pollination for the seeds that they will lay their eggs on, but not all of them right. do. So uh, it, it, it's something that I'm also very curious and uh, I want to follow up. Have you been able to see, and maybe this is sort of a weird question, but how much more effective those uh, feathered CD are at holding pollen? Like, do you see more pollen attached to the ones with the feathery CD or scales, sorry, than you yeah. do um, without? That's all speculation as of now. Like I, I, we need yeah, to yeah. really do this. Uh, so I found this actually. So that, that's a, the interchange between natural history and systematics, right? So because I, I knew those those scales were there, but I didn't, never paid attention to them much. Um, and then because I found with genetics that there were different species, then I started looking really closely what what the differences between those species, and I found. Uh, uh, those scales as one of the diagnostic characters. But, right. uh, but that was way after I had done, I was done with my field work. So I, I couldn't see. go back and actually do any tests. Now, now, now I hope to do it. So let's see. Sure, <laughs> sure. How would you test that in the field? That's a good question. I was thinking uh, one way, one possible way uh, could be to get fresh specimens, like uh, breed them and get uh, specimens that had never um, been exposed to pollen, for example. And then we can either get pollen or proxy for pollen, like a uh, uh, sure. fluorescent powder or something like this, and get them coated and see how much sticks, that kind of thing. Uh, it would have to be uh, more well thought. But, uh, but I think that's one way to functionally and, sure. and shave them and then see what happens when you shave them, you know. Like, like, right, like, right, you know? right. I think there was a student at KU that was shaving bees or wasps as part of his dissertation while I was there. So it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have some other questions in the chat. So um, let me see. Um, uh, first, from Ben Patterson, um, do you have any ideas for how citizen science can be improved to help uh, take out some of that human bias? Oh, I actually don't. Uh, and, and I think its role, it's not entirely supporting research. It's also motivating people and, uh, and you know, making people uh, like nature and, and, and go out there and see things. And, and, and this goal not always equates with very, uh, very, very um, controlled research experiments, right? Uh, sure, and, sure. And I, and I think that's fine. Um, we just need to be aware of biases. And uh, just like we are with museum collections, we know the biases mm -hmm. we have. And, um, 
and so and so I think they are very useful. And I, and I think like I showed you a focus specifically on one part of the data set that I think is really biased, but I'm actually using this data for other things too that I think are less biased. So, sure, so, sure. so I think uh, that, that's basically how it goes. Okay, cool. Um, and then we have two more questions um, and then I think we'll have to wrap it up. So um, this is from uh, Toby Shu or Shu, um, I wonder if weevils, first, very good presentation, um, and I wonder if weevils pollinate differently compared to bees. Totally, yes. Um, so there are many differences. Uh, one of them, they don't have a home unlike, unlike bees, so mm -hmm. they can travel uh, potentially great distances going from flower to flower to flower to flower, uh, uh, like throughout the month that they are adults alive or something like this. Um, and that, and, and that um, already creates some difference. And I'm looking now in Panama, for example, if that leads to di different uh, genetic sources for the pollen that reaches. Uh, sure. Um, that's one of them. The other is, um, so they don't live in colonies. Or not all bees do either, but uh, uh, weevils never do. And, and, and right. you, know, you don't have that colony effect of everything coming. Their behavior is very different. They will not be flying, you know, throughout the day from flower to flower to flower. They will usually stick. Right, to they'll stick to one, yeah. To one, and then when it's done, they'll go to another. So that that has also differences by for the breeding structure uh, of the plant. So there are many, many differences that I think sure. should affect also plant evolution. Sure, sure. Um, thank you. And then we have one more question from Rowan French. Um, awesome talk, Bruno. Um, is contaminant pollen, um, e.g. from environments in which specimens were prepared and stored, much of a problem when trying to identify which plant species particular weevils pollinate? I'm sure they are. <laughs> so that's why I, I, I'm doing a test now. Um, and, uh, one of the reasons, so the, the funding that I got to do this was for DNA barcoding, but it, to be very honest, I think DNA barcoding has limitations there because fresh po contaminant pollen is probably mm -hmm. going to overwhelm the signal of uh, what's there already. Um, right. So, and that's why I think some new tools of like automated slide scanning and using AI to identify pollen can be less sensitive to contamination. The, sure. The one thing uh, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I want to say is that for this test, we are only using Central American uh, insects and mostly because STRI has a good database, both of pollen and of uh, DNA. Uh, plant oh, DNA. that's so, an amazing data set. Yes, and then, uh, but since the specimens are here in Chicago, they mm -hmm. have been housed here, so they should have oak, pine, and all sorts of like wind-borne pollen, if that's a problem, it right. should be in those specimens. So like if we start finding a lot of northern temperate species in what would be tropical, <laughs> then you'll know. Then we will know that's concerning. Sure, sure. All right, Bruno. Well, thanks so much. That was a really good talk. Um, and thank you all so much. So thanks to our other speakers. Um, you've now seen um, what our, our students and our members can do. Um, so I encourage